Com. I got the sign to start. My name is Vera Edenberger. I'm the managing director of a small non-profit organization here in Berlin, which supports people who are discriminated against in legal actions. And we are a small part of the project Fair Renting, Fair Living. I will chair the next session and will now do this in English for those who need a headset for translation into German, please get one to follow the discussion. I have joined us just now because the first part of the program was um, a closed session. The session now and the part later on is public and I see a number of new faces in the room. Very much welcome to you as well. What we will do in the next panel is um, to get a number of introductions about the legal settings and frameworks of various countries. We will start with Germany. We'll look into the conditions in Canada. We'll then see how the US is dealing with fair housing and which ideas colleagues in Sweden are developing in the moment to provide fair housing. Um, I would like to introduce the speakers each time they come and give their presentation. And I would love to start with my colleague, Alexander Tischbereck. He's working um, at the legal faculty of the Humboldt University in Berlin and will introduce the Equal Treatment Act, particularly when it comes to discrimination in the housing sector. Please, um, use the, the, the table up here and then have a seat after your presentation. Yeah, herzlich willkommen, Alexander Tischbach. Welcome. Alexander Tischbach is my name. I work at the Humboldt University. I was told that I have 10 minutes to talk about the potential and borders of the AGG, which is a very difficult challenge, but let me try to master it. And if you don't have enough time, you have to expand your topic. I think this is what good speakers do. Not only do we have discrimination bans in our legislation, but also in our constitution. When it comes to housing, I think this is a very interesting aspect that we should focus on. Like how do constitutional laws and the AGG go together. You might know Article 3 of our Constitution. Nobody must be discriminated against because of his or her origin, race, language, home. Nobody must be discriminated against because of their disabilities. And then we have regional constitutions uh, that also have discrimination bans. For instance, in Berlin's constitution, we have sexual identity as an additional category listed. What is the problem with our constitutional law when it comes to housing? Now, we have our basic law. This is our constitution. So it is only the government, the state that has to commit to this. This is Article 1 of our basic law. This is a problem because when it comes to housing, we often have to deal with private landlords, but not only with private ones, because the state-owned housing companies have been covered by our constitution ever since we have had the constitution, because they are part of the city administration. But when it comes to the private players, it becomes more difficult. Basic laws also apply to private players, but how is even something that the courts sometimes don't even know. There were some unclear aspects, and this is why the AGG, the anti-discrimination law, was passed in August 2006. So the AGG, which is our act, was adopted in 2006, and it was adopted as a consequence of transposition of the anti-discrimination directors of the EU. It has a discrimination ban, but also an entitlement to reimbursement. And what is very important for practice, it has accompanying rules regarding execution. There's a focus on labor law, but in paragraphs 19 to 21, we also have sections that stipulate general tenancy 
law, that is general civil law. I would like to highlight three problems in this context. So sections 19 to 21 bring about certain problems. First problem, we have a non-standardized rule regime or regulation regime regarding the different categories of discrimination. Section 9 is not really easy to understand. Even lawyers read it five times and don't really know what it means. Second problem, we have rule out regulations as part of this act, and they actually contradict the directives of the EU, which is, of course, a problem because we have to work with these deficits, these execution deficits in court. And when it comes to the relationship to private players, it is very, very difficult to really start lawsuits and get a court ruling to your own benefit. Then we have also factual barriers when it comes to legal execution, and I will come back to this in the end. First problem, non-standardized regulations. So we have a relatively solid protection from discrimination. We have section 19 here. It says that all business that affects the access to and provision of goods and services that are available to the public include housing. So this is the first paragraph this, that governs this. And you have to say that tenancies are covered by this. This is basically what the German law stipulates. There are different people who comment on this, and they have problems with this formulation that are available to the public. They say tenancy has nothing to do with public spheres. Therefore, the private tenant-landlord relationship is not part of this law, but courts and jurisdictions see this differently. So we do not only talk about fair housing, but also about fair renting and fair living. So we also think about the purchase of real estate. So if somebody can not get a purchase agreement and cannot buy property because he's discriminated against, then we have a problem. Because if a property is a good in the sense of the act is highly questionable. This results in lengthy discussions. It's very complex, but maybe it would be worth to take this to court. It's very, very unclear how the outcome would be in court. If we talk about other forms of discrimination, sexist discrimination, discrimination for religion, disability, age, and sexual identity, here we have section 19, and it's normally only mass deals and mass businesses and transactions that are covered by section 19. Here it says, when it comes to tenancies, this act should only govern if a landlord has 50 and more housing units on the market. And of course, this is a huge limitation in practice, as you can imagine. And here again, the buying of property is not covered. A real estate contract is not a mass transaction in the sense of, or in the meaning of the law. And I finally understood how you can mark texts in red. And uh, yeah, I could use this a couple of times. I'm very proud of myself. So section 19 cannot be reconciled with European directives, which is a problem. And if you want to reduce the discrepancy between the law and the EU directive, you have to go to court, which is very risky. Second problem. So certain situations that are ruled out. So you are not allowed to unequally treat people. And this is to the benefit of creating balanced, well-balanced settlement structures and well-balanced economic, social, and cultural situations and conditions. It is questionable what the legislator intends here. This is part of the 
law. However, it goes against EU directives. It's very difficult to execute this and put this into practice because private landlords would have to have access to statistics in terms of what a certain region and area looks like. There are no tangible figures and facts on this. And it is very difficult to ex execute this because it is in contrast to EU directives. The only thing that might be possible is positive measures, which is affirmative action, if you like. So affirmative action can be maybe done in the meaning of this paragraph, but it is, the formulation is way too wide. The AGG should not apply in case of debt relations. And this can happen in the case of tenancies if the parties or relatives use housing on the same property. This should become red instead of green, but something else is happening here. This is also violating EU directives. So in the anti-racism directive, there is no paragraph on this. And in the directive, in the anti-sexism directive, something like that is said. You have justifying facts for private and family life, but private and family life is much more narrow than the wording up here. So it's way too broad. So it would make sense to take this to court in order to close the gap and discrepancy between national law and European law. Last but not least, last slide, deficit when it comes to execution. We have had this act since 2006, and in Euris and in Beck Online, in these two online databases, there are about 50 rulings on this, which is actually nothing. Think about how many tenancies and how many leases we have or are concluded every day or terminated. So 50 rulings on in Euris and Beck Online platforms and only a very small fraction on tenancy in the narrow sense. So there was a concern in the beginning. People were afraid of a whole flood of lawsuits, but they that didn't happen. So this indicates that we have a problem. And what could be the potential problem? We have huge hurdles when it comes to minorities taking certain things to court. They are very afraid of going to court. So the hurdles are way too high. And we have problems with evidence. If my application is not taken or is not accepted, how can I prove that this happened because I have a foreign name? It's very difficult to prove this. Possible solutions, more education, and collective action. Thank you. I'm afraid that the 10 minutes mean that the presenters speak quicker <laughs> and the interpreters have a big problem. I hope it's, it works more or less. Thank you very much. So our next speaker came a long way from Toronto to Berlin. Um, Mr. Vincent Tong um, is giving a second presentation today. And we are looking forward to hear how Toronto is dealing with housing and discrimination Give us an insight of what you're doing there. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, for those that are were here in the earlier afternoon, I'm gonna. There's some repeat slides for those that are new. Then, um, then uh, this will all be new to you. Um, but who are who is Toronto Community Housing? Just at a really snapshot, we are the largest social housing provider in the city of Toronto, the municipality. Uh, we're the second largest in North America after the New York Housing Authority. We have about 110,000 uh, tenants in our portfolio. We have 60,000 social housing units, uh, which might not seem like a lot, but in the North American context, that's 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 quite a lot. 90% um, of our tenants receive a government subsidy, so that means that their rent is 30% of their gross household income, and then the rest of the um, amount of their rent is provided by the government. Um, their average household income is about 10,000 uh, euro, about 15,000 Canadian dollars. Um, and uh, we were formed by mer a merger of three different uh, housing providers in, about, in the early 2000s. 
In terms of the legal structure, um, uh, really it's the, there's a federal government and there's provincial governments and there's no overlap in jurisdictions between the two. Uh, really anything that falls under the province is under the provincial mandate and anything that falls under the federal government is the federal mandate. And that's really, you know, I'm not going to get into the politics, tick, tick, politics of it, uh, but it was really to, to appease Quebec, the, the, the French province. Um, so we are a nonprofit housing corporation that's owned by the City of Toronto, as I mentioned. Uh, we're governed by a board of directors, and in that board of directors, we have two tenant representatives, and they help make decisions on the, on the organization. Uh, the province is responsible for all the legislation that governs subsidized housing, while the municipalities are responsible for funding and managing those housing providers. There's about 230 housing providers in the city of Toronto. The province is responsible, as I mentioned, for the legislation, and that includes something called the Housing Services Act and the Residential Tenancies Act. And both of those I'll get into in, in a little bit more detail, um, but those those are the two governing pieces of legislation in the province. At a high level, we have something called the Ontario Human Rights Code, um, and it is based heavily on um, the, uh, the, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in Canada. And what this does is it provides legal protection for people seeking housing, protecting people on 14 identified grounds of discrimination. These include race, uh, color, ancestry, creed, place of origin, ethnic origin, citizenship, sex, sexual orientation, age, marital status, family status, a disability, and receipt of public assistance. The Housing Services Act, which is also under provincial legislation, prevents landlords from disqualifying applicants for subsidized housing if they have a criminal record, if their immigration status is a refugee, a refugee claimant, a permanent resident, or a permanent resident applicant, and they are between 16 and 18 years old. I heard a little, a little earlier today that most of the housing providers that, that were in the morning session, it was, the age limit was 18 years and older. So in Ontario, you can't discriminate someone that's basically between the ages of 16 and 18. And then in terms of the city of Toronto, the municipality, municipality, there's something called the Housing Opportunities Toronto Action Plan. And it was developed to achieve the goal to, of providing safe ac uh, access to housing um, and affordable housing, um, including um, uh, providing emergency shelters for people that are experiencing homelessness. Right now, that plan is currently being updated by the city, and it's going to include people with disabilities, women, racialized groups, LGBTQ2S peoples, uh, immigrants and refugees, and persons with low income. And finally, those housing project mandates. This is something that the municipality issues to those 230 social housing providers in the, in the city. And it states that subsidized housing providers can apply to the city to house a particular client group at one of their housing projects, if doing so will relieve hardship or economic disadvantage, assist disadvantaged persons or groups to achieve or attempt to achieve equal opportunity, and likely contribute to the elimination of the infringement of rights under the Ontario Human Rights Code. So for example, if you're a housing provider, you can specifically target uh, a different, uh, you can build a building that only lets to people with a certain disability, for example. So this provides, it's, it, this provides you that ability to do so. And what is our role as the social housing provider in the municipality for, uh, for anti-discrimination policies? We have something called the Human Rights Harassment and Fair Access Policy. It largely reflects the Ontario Human Rights Code. We also have a relocation policy. I oversee the real estate development arm of the, the company. So we're moving people en masse. We've, like, uh, we've moved 1,600 tenants to date. We're demolishing their housing and rebuilding their housing. And we have a policy that protects uh, their right to return. It protects transparency. It doesn't allow us to discriminate. Um, it also gives tenants the right to uh, return from, from, from which they were relocated. Uh, and then in that uh, a policy, we also have a really robust accessibility requirement. Uh, so as part of redevelopment of our communities, 15% uh, of our, all of our housing need to meet new accessibility guidelines. These guidelines were developed by, uh, um, by tenants that each have different types of mobility issues. 
Um, and so they've gone into units and they've tested turning circles, heights of countertops, placements of appliances, buttons, doors, do they open, do they slide? Um, and so we've developed a, a, a robust policy that covers how we build new housing. And 15% of all of our new housing have to meet these requirements. Uh, and 5% of our existing stock is being refurbished to meet this new accessibility requirement. And if you have an accessibility requirement and we're not currently meeting your needs, we will modify your unit to make sure that we do comply. In new buildings, we've also designed our buildings to be inclusive. So this is just an example of, of the main floor of one of the houses that we've been building in, in, in a part of the city of Toronto. And you'll see on the far left, we have an open concept kitchen with a breakfast bar that's open to the other room. It's a very desirable space. Um, but then we started hearing from tenants, particularly women and particularly Muslim women uh, who conveyed to us that the open concept kitchen uh, uh, was a little bit problematic for them in that they couldn't remove any religious head, head, head scarves uh, when they were cooking because the entire house was open to, to the rest of the house. So we developed an option uh, that closes off the kitchen. We, we built a wall and we, and we provided a door and 10% of the units that we built had this modification in it. We also held, heard from um, tenants with elderly parents or, or people with mobility challenges uh, that they didn't wanna go up and down stairs when they were visiting uh, friends or relatives to use the washroom. So we also developed a model uh, that had a main floor washroom to meet, the, to meet those, uh, those needs. And then we've also developed a really robust tenant participation system. And really this is to remove barriers um, to, to engaging with tenants essentially. Uh, we provide food, childcare, translation and interpretation at all of our meetings. Um, we also do targeted group uh, outreach. So we've met with, we have a Muslim, a women's group that we meet, that we've met with, uh, you know, we've met with seniors, we've met with youth, uh, people that typically don't participate in these processes. Uh, we've specifically targeted so that we ensure that we are reflecting their values in in what we do as a housing company. How do we implement equitable house, uh, access to, uh, to housing? Well, the City of Toronto manages the wait list for subsidized housing, including approving applications for eligibility. I just will preface this by saying there's about 100,000 people on the current social housing waiting list in Toronto, and it's about a 10-year wait. Uh, the average market rent in the city is about 2,000 Canadian dollars for a one-bedroom, and houses are now trading at a million dollars on the average. TCHC offers vacant units to eligible households in the order of priority and chronological order on the waiting list, and every seventh vacant subsidized unit must be filled by a household that is disadvantaged. We must follow the direction of our shareholder, which is the municipality, on political advocacy. We're also a member of provincial and federal organizations, and we work to affect improved socially inclusive and affordable housing policies. Thank you. Thank you very much. And stay up there and take a seat wherever you like. And maybe Alexander can join him that he's not that alone. Morgan, it's your, you were the next one. And he came as far away as Vincent from the US to introduce the Fair Housing Act and the legal work that he's doing within this legal framework. And that's a particular challenge <laughs> to do this in 10 minutes. And therefore he asked me, and I'm not treating him differently than the others, he asked me after five minutes to give him a signal and after when there are two minutes left. So um, he asked me for that. Thank the you. floor is yours. Thank you and thanks to the translation services and for you all accommodating my limited English uh, communication capabilities here. Uh, I'm the general counsel with the National Fair Housing Alliance, which is a nonprofit uh, agency based in the United States. Um, <clears throat> and I've been asked to talk about uh, fair housing enforcement. I'll talk about the 50 years of the Fair Housing Act and its dual goals, an overview of its protections, and, an, and a brief overview of enforcement. The Fair Housing Act was passed as a federal response to the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. 
Actually, in Chicago in 1966, Dr. King pioneered some of the fair housing testing that has been uh, developed as a bedrock of the work that we do. He was assassinated in 1968, and a week later, um, amid riots across the country, Congress uh, passed the Federal Fair Housing Act. Um, <clears throat> it being the 50th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act, there's been a great deal of reflection this year on what has been accomplished under the Fair Housing Act and what remains to be done. Um, our office put together a short documentary on the seven days between the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King and the passage of the act, and it shows that even in that context, um, passing the act was a very contested measure. Um, we've also developed a timeline of some of the major events, both before the Fair Housing Act and under the Fair Housing Act, regarding fair housing enforcement in the United States. Senator, former Senator Walter Mondale, who is one of the co-authors of the bill, drafted an op-ed um, titled, The Civil Rights Law We Ignored, um, and <clears throat> is critical, I think, of, of the uh, ultimate accomplishments that we've achieved under the Fair Housing Act. He did note that the Fair Housing Act was an attempt by Congress to translate the work of Dr. King into enduring statute, um, and then noted that uh, the story of the first 50 years of the Fair Housing Act has been one of gradual pro progress and frequent setbacks. In taking stock of where we've come in 50 years, there's uh, a lot to be said just in terms of these images. Um, 1968, this is in the course of the riots that followed the assassination of Dr. King. In 2015, also in Baltimore, this is uh, in the course of unrest following the murder of Freddie Gray, an un unarmed um, black individual who was, who was killed by the police there. Um, down here you have a KKK march from uh, 1928 in Washington, D.C., and here from last, last year in Charlottesville, uh, a white nationalist march. Um, so uh, though, though discrimination is not overt, there's still a lot of uh, racial prejudice and prejudice of various sorts, and earlier there was a reference to discrimination with a smile, or what's also referred to as revolving door discrimination, where housing providers will allow individuals to come in, they'll shake their hand, and then they'll show them the door. Um, and so there's still a, a great need um, in terms of the treatment of um, prospective tenants and otherwise. There's also uh, a persistent um, issues with um, residential segregation along racial lines. And this originally started in the United States through explicit federal policies. This is a, uh, what's referred to as a redlining map. And if you uh, look at um, this particular resource, there's actually maps all over the United States that specifically identified where the federal government would offer home loans, and they redlined communities of color. Today, if you track to the populations of jurisdictions, you see that the exact populations that were put into place in the function of these federal policies exist. Um, the same boulevards draw the same lines, and there, there are, though not explicit redlining practices, many practices of redlining that exist and perpetuate that residential segregation. The impact of this residential segregation touches all aspects of our lives in the United States. Um, you can see wealth tied deeply to home ownership in the United States. Average white households in the United States in 2009 had over $113,000 in median household wealth, whereas African American households had just over $5,600 in household wealth. Uh, going to the far map just to talk about the link between segregation and health. If you look, this is in New Orleans, my hometown. Um, <clears throat> the white zip code to the left and the black zip code to the right. You can then look down in the chart. The life expectancy in the white zip code is 80 years. The life expectancy in the black zip code is 54.5 years. Um, this is not a function of something that I intended to be a part of the <laughs> slide. But um, it, so in essence, the Fair Housing Act was passed to serve two goals, to eliminate housing discrimination and to promote residential integration. And in Mondale's words, we still have a lot of work to do, in particular in regards to that second goal. The Fair Housing Act was passed in 1968 with the protections of race, color, religion, and national origin. It was amended in the 70s amid the women's rights movement and again in the 80s amid the disability rights movement and also adding protections on the basis of families with children, which is often used as a proxy for race and discrimination. There are a number of local and state fair housing laws which have a number of additional protections. Some of the noteworthy ones are source of income or whether or not you use a housing 
voucher or government assistance, uh, sexual orientation, age, and, and the list goes on. The transactions that are covered include rental housing, which I think is the focus of some of this discussion, but also sales, lending, insurance, harassment, and other kinds of uh, housing transactions. The remedies that you can secure under the Federal Fair Housing Act are extensive. They include uh, broad injunctive relief, which could be you know, access to a unit. Um, they include um, broad uh, monetary damages, including you know, um, both emotional distress and also concrete identified expenses that may have resulted from the discrimination. They also include uh, attorney's fees as a fee shifting provision, such as if you bring a, f a successful Fair Housing Act, not only does the defendant have to pay your damages, but they have to pay your attorney's fees, which allows for this kind of enforcement work. The law says that you can't discriminate, but it doesn't define exactly how you prove discrimination. So the courts have developed different methods to define how you prove discrimination, including various um, approaches to, to proving intentional discrimination. And separate from intentional discrimination, the courts have defined disparate impact liability as a form of discrimination of the Fair Housing Act, which is to say a neutral policy or policy that's non-discriminatory on its face that's then put into practice and has a discriminatory effect can be regarded as discriminatory. That may impact rental policy like occupancy limits or no criminal background, no eviction records, no housing vouchers. The enforcement of the law, um, <clears throat> there's uh, a number of federal agencies and some state agencies, as well as private fair housing enforcement. Uh, the lion's share of enforcement work that goes on is, um, is brought by private fair housing enforcement agencies. This is the National Fair Housing Alliance, my organization. We are actually a membership organization of local fair housing centers. If you go to our website on the Find Local Help tab, you can find those local fair housing centers. Our board is made up of directors of those local fair housing centers. Incidentally, there's really great jurisprudence um, under the Fair Housing Act in the United States around organizational standing for private offices to bring fair housing cases. This is in part because of the subtle nature of discrimination and because of the extent to which there needs to be in-depth testing inve investigations that are used to prove discrimination. When I say testing, I mean mystery shopping in the housing market or sending out folks to inquire about housing or loan availability in a controlled fashion. Um, there's a great uh, This American Life radio series. Thank you that features uh, some of this. Um, and you can actually look at one of the cases that, um, that I brought before working with the National Fair Housing Alliance that has some of the testing recordings embedded in the news release. Um, so there's over 4 million instances of discrimination in the United States every year, and less than 30,000 30, 30, acts of enforcement, which is to say that there's a great deal of discrimination that goes unenforced. Disability is the majority of the cases that are brought in recent years, followed by race and familial status. Regards to some of the cases that we've, we've brought in recent years, brought a case against Travelers Insurance, a large insurance company in the US, that wouldn't provide hazard insurance to landlords that rented to Section 8 vouchers. And we said that that was discrimination on, on the basis of a local protection for source of income, as well as in regards to the impact that it had on race under the Federal Fair Housing Act. We, we have a current case pending against Facebook. Facebook is, uh, you know, in addition to being a social media platform, a huge advertising company, and it allows advertisers to micro-target their advertisements. That's, been, uh, that's a problem in the housing context. Uh, the Fair Housing Act assigns liability not only to those that advertise in a discriminatory fashion, but also to the publishers of those ads. And we're alleging that the structure, the, f the, the platform that Facebook has that allows for the micro-targeting of those housing ads is discriminatory. Um, I actually got involved in fair housing work in the wake of Hurricane Katrina um, when St. Bernard Parish passed a blood, ordin ordinance, uh, blood, excuse me, blood relative ordinance, which said that landlords could only rent to their blood relatives. This was challenged under the Fair Housing Act. Uh, St. Bernard Parish homeowners were over 93% white. They were directly across the train tracks from residents in the Lower, lower Ninth Ward who were over 90% black, and it was passed in the context of significant racial animus. Uh, another case that we pursued at the time was Louisiana administered the largest rebuilding program in the U.S. history, a $13 billion program called the Road Home Program, which based the award in part on the value of, of uh, a pre-storm value of the home, which in, baked in historic undervaluing of African-American communities. And we said, alternatively, just base it on the cost of rebuilding, which would be a flat value. 
Um, <clears throat> There is a mandate that says that HUD funds must be used in a way that affirmatively furthering, f furthers fair housing, HUD, the US uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development. There's a lot more that could be said about this. Um, there's a few publications that I would reference. One is an annual trends report on fair housing enforcement that we produce, and another is a monthly publication on uh, legal uh, decisions under the Fair Housing Act. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't note under this administration that there are some significant challenges to fair housing enforcement, not just under in regards to a lack of enforcement, but in regards to strategic efforts to dismantle the tools for enforcement. And uh, I, there's a lot more to be said, but that's a little bit of the work that we do. Thank you very much, Morgan. That uh, was quite a challenging um, 10 minutes. Um, I would have wished these 10 minutes would have been 30 minutes because you said a lot of things that I'm personally very interested in. I'm in a lucky situation that we're going to have lunch, dinner tomorrow. So I will hear more. <laughs> um, we are expecting now two ladies from Sweden. Um, Anna. Ericsson and Anna Werner are give, giving us an introduction about the current project um, concerning discrimination in access to housing. Um, and they're both working for the Swedish Ombudsman office in Stockholm. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much and good evening. Sorry. <laughs> Anna and Anna, we're such yeah. a team. <laughs> Oh, this is yours? Yeah. So, oh, anti-discrimination work in the field of housing, need for action. Um, yeah. So, we are from the Swedish Equality Ombudsman, DO. And DO is a governmental agency formed on the 1st of January 2009 and has replaced the four previous anti-discrimination ombudsmen. And the main task is combating discrimination. And Agneta Broberg is the ombudsman. The ombudsman has identified the rental housing market as one of the areas in the Swedish society where discrimination take place and where there is a risk of discrimination. Therefore, the Ombudsman has decided that housing is a priority issue during 2017 until 2020. And one problem that affects the existence of discrimination on the housing market in Sweden is related to the way the housing market is regulated and how the responsibility to ensure the right to housing without discrimination is organized. There is no legislation that directly regulates the right to housing and the responsibility of the local authorities is unclear. On the other hand, there is a ban on discrimination when distributing housing to the general public. The risks of discriminations identified concerning the rental housing market are related to how the stakeholders on the housing market apply the legislations and assign and applies their own policies, rules, and practices. Discrimination on the housing market is, of course, a complex and vast area. And to have the opportunity to really make a change, the Ombudsman has chosen to limit our work to these two problem areas. And we will, in the following years, try to work strategically to change these phenomena. So the problem, problems identified in this project is A, the lack of transparency and predictability in the allocation systems can lead to discrimination. And B, landlords use rental criteria that are discriminatory or can lead to discrimination. And landlords apply criteria in a discriminatory way. So what we know today. So according to Swedish law, municipalities must, if necessary to promote housing supply, arrange housing services. Today, however, only 12 of 290 municipalities have their own local housing agency. 
Also, 13 municipalities are connected to another municipality's housing agency or marketplace. In addition to these housing agencies, there are also other ways for the local authorities to work with the distribution of housing. More than 270 municipalities have one or more public housing company, and almost all of them have their own waiting list. And even private landlords and housing companies often have their own waiting lists. The allocation systems and rental criteria found in the housing market are clear examples of discriminatory structures that affect the right to housing. Both the way the systems are designed and their lack of clarity and transparency facilitates arbitrary decisions and this poses a risk of discrimination. And in addition to the Anti-Discrimination Act, there are few regulations uh, regarding how housing should be assigned in Sweden. So to sum up, uh, the lack of transparent allocation systems, no regulation on landlord criteria apart from the Discrimination Act, and no obligatory documentation, leads to significant difficulties in proving discrimination in the individual case, and this contributes to the fact that the protection against discrimination is not as strong as it could be, which poses a risk of discrimination. Uh, and now Anna is going to talk about how criteria can lead to discrimination. Yes, so we're very happy to be here and to talk about this important issue. And we haven't been able to, to give you the context of uh, housing property in Sweden, but we're focusing directly on discrimination and what we are working with in our project. And so uh, we have the Swedish Discrimination Act saying that anyone supplying housing to the general public is prohibited to discriminate. Uh, we have investigated a few cases in Sweden looking at... Uh, discriminatory criteria that landlords set up, and for most of the cases regard ethnicity. For example, we had a case a couple of years ago um, where a person made a complaint to the Swedish Ombudsman uh, that a landlord was requiring permanent residentship in order for you to, to receive a flat um, in, in this uh, property. Uh, and the landlord said, because we started an investigation, the landlord said, but this is my way to ensure an income, uh, because without a permanent residence ship, uh, the person can, can be evicted from Sweden and, and I will not have my, my rent. Uh, we said that we investigated the case and we said that such a criteria does lead to indirect discrimination because it does exclude all people who do not have permanent residence ships or people of another ethnicity. Um, and so that was one of our cases. And we were looking into more what criteria can lead to discrimination in the field of housing. Uh, another case that we looked into was uh, a case where there was a landlord who, when he found out that the person wanting to move into the flat uh, was disabled and had a personal assistant. Uh, and the landlord then required, well, I will, uh, I will have to hire your rent because you have a personal assistant and you will run down the flat. Uh, you will, uh, this is, it will cost me a lot more to keep this flat for you. Uh, we investigated that case as well and we said, well, that's, that's discrimination directly, uh, direct discrimination in regards to his uh, disability. And that was another case that, where we were hope, that we are hoping to, to bring about change when it comes to criteria that landlords uh, set. But what we can see now is that there are quite a few criteria that landlords set in Sweden, and that's why we we're focusing on this in our project, is to see um, how we can work with, with different criteria that landlords set up in Sweden. And we've started to look at potential criteria, what could they look like and what could what could uh, actually be a breach of the Swedish Discrimination Act. And such criteria that we're looking into right now at the moment are criteria where, where landlords exclude incomes of different kinds. Incomes if you receive a disability benefit uh, or a student loan or... Um, in Sweden, you have uh, you receive a, a, cert a certain social benefit if you've uh, newly come to Sweden as an immigrant. 
and excluding those incomes, uh, we are thinking that that is, is a breach of the Swedish Discrimination Act. And that is what we're going to focus on now in our project for the next coming years and to try and make, bring about change in this field. So summarising, we can see that many criteria will probably or could probably lead to discrimination. Um, and what we want to do is to make sure that there are no such uh, discriminatory criteria. Uh, and what we've seen so far is that it's a lot more common with criteria that exclude people uh, on basis of their ethnicity. Yeah. So the aim of this project is to increase the transparency and predictability of the letting system, as well as to eliminate discriminatory rental criteria and contribute so that they are not being applied in a d discriminatory way. Uh, and this is not easy, as you all understand. So finally, we want to show you this stair to illustrate our long-term work for change regarding access to housing without discrimination. And we are now in phase three. And for the moment, we're among other things trying to establish, establish the Ombudsman as an important stakeholder in the field. And we will collaborate with the researcher community and local anti-discrimination bodies. We offer seminars and trainings. We forward information to the government um, concerning housing. And uh, in phase four, the last phase, we will sum up our knowledge and experience in a report where we hopefully have some recommendations on how the identified problems can be solved. And uh, our expectation is that the stakeholders and the housing market at that moment have the ability to identify uh, rental criteria that can lead to discrimination and if necessary, change their criteria so that they don't violate the Discrimination Act. But uh, hopefully we can come back in two years and tell you all the results. <laughs> and I was, uh, I just thought of, instead of stairway to heaven, this is a stairway to housing, which is hopefully Ooh. our aim. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. The Thank staircase you. to heaven would be nice, to housing even better. So thank you very much to all of you for giving those contributions. Um, as we have started a few minutes late, I would like to end a few minutes later, just a few minutes, because I would not like to miss a little bit of a discussion with the people have that are attending the conference. Um, from what I have heard from you, you may not have um, used those words, but the four key aspects that I heard in your presentations were one, we need proper legislation. And if it's not proper enough, it needs to be changed. I've heard that if you have laws, you need to use them, litigate, and it may change to something. What I've heard from Canada is um, we, you need action plans, you need to have a, a target, you need to have a goal to work towards, and you need to have proper criteria along which you can work. Um, those four aspects may give an indication for the situation in Germany. How do you see this? Any comments, any thoughts on this? If there are no thoughts, just there is a thought. <laughs> Our legal colleague from Berlin has told us a lot about the default, the, the defects of the German law. And I wonder how that could be changed in a political system which is not very renter friendly. And uh, what are your suggestions in this field? How could we get to eliminate uh, the 50 plus uh, rule in anti-discrimination in housing? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, well, if, uh, we've tried to change the AGG for several years and it doesn't happen. Um, and it's not gonna happen within the next couple of years, probably. So um, another option would be to, to use the judiciary. And that's what some NGOs are trying, to use uh, strategic litigation 
to, um, to get courts to tell us that this provision of the AGG is invalid because it's uh, against European law. So we would need a good case. We need a case we have where we have good proof. Um, a tenant with less than 50 units should be possible to get one. And then we need to win the case. And if it's on the books, and if it's high enough on the books by a high court or something like that, that's a good option to to change to change the law uh, for the future, although we don't change the text of the law. How about the action programs? Any thoughts on this? If this is not the case, we can continue in the program. Okay. Um, in that. <laughs> okay, you have the. the uh, I wanted to ask the Swedish colleagues: Do you go to court as well? Do you have an? You may, may you go to? Uh, you have a mandate to go to court, because you might have the same problems with European Union uh, legislation that is not quite uh, the same as the Swedish legislation. And yeah, we didn't quite follow the beginning of your presentation uh, due to the um, lack of. Yeah, we didn't have the headphones. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, I don't really understand the, the, um, the problems. I didn't really quite catch the problems with the German law. But we do in Sweden have the mandate to, to go to court and represent an individual who's been discriminated against. Very few. We do not want to brag about how few they are. <laughs> uh, a couple a year, right, uh, 10 to 15 a year. And actually, it's a part of our project as well to try to find a good case to take to court. How is it with your experience? Um, because you are doing litigation and you're probably doing it in a strategic way. Do you actually sense that there is a change coming with litigation or is it difficult to see that? Oh yeah. Uh, well, um, we're, we're very driven by the jurisprudence under the Fair Housing Act and um, yeah, we're uh, very involved in various circuit and Supreme Court related matters that there've been two uh, fair housing cases that have gone before the Supreme Court in recent years, one in 2015, which was dealt with the question of whether or not um, disparate impact liability is cognizable under the Fair Housing Act, despite 40 years of consensus among the circuits, a very conservative Supreme Court um, took up the issue and it was actually, they took it up three times, they took it up in 2011, they took it up in 2013, and then they took it up in 2014. And actually in the two prior cases, it was sort of settled and the cert petition was withdrawn out of concern for civil rights jurisprudence on the part of the city of St. Paul, which was the defendant in that case. When the Supreme Court came down with the decision, there was a lot of concern that they would overturn this 40 years of of, of Supreme Court jurisprudence, but then Justice Kennedy um, issued a 5-4 decision that I think was greatly impacted by the unrest in Baltimore. In fact, it referenced unrest that um, uh, occurred and when the law was passed, and it referenced the ongoing need for the Fair Housing Act in regards to this continued set of issues. Um, yeah, uh, we, we are really active in um, filing amicus briefs or friend of the court briefs um, on a number of issues. and. Uh, you know, there's a, a broad set of issues regarding the scope of harm that could be alleged, the ability to pursue actions against landlords who aren't taking corrective action um, upon, uh, regarding the discriminatory harassment of their, that their tenants are engaging in is actually just an issue that's been being brought, to, uh, the cert has been filed to the Supreme Court to bring the issue to the Supreme Court. So there's a lot of uh, ability to define the scope of the law in the courts and we're very strategic about that. Thank you very much. I actually do hope that um, the communication continues uh, while you may be back home and um, that we stay in touch in order to get experiences that you are gathering in Sweden. But you still had one more point? Uh, no, I had a, a question. So okay. I didn't want you to finish. Okay, yeah. Um, I was indeed about to finish, but uh, uh, then you will um, raise. Well? Yes, please, yes. <laughs> I wanted to ask uh, Vincent Tong uh, about what happens when you renovate uh, the apartments, what happens to the rents? 
So it's all controlled uh, rent, so it won't ever increase. So even when we, uh, you know, we've been rebuilding our communities, uh, you know, over the development program, uh, we're going to be rebuilding about 4,800 social housing units. Um, and basically the tenant's rent is guaranteed. It's a contract that we sign. It will never increase because it's based on their income. Right, so uh, as long as you continue receiving a government subsidy, then you will continue receive paying the rent that you've been pay paying. Now there is the, the challenge of we do have tenants, and this might get a little bit complicated, but we do have tenants in Toronto Community Housing that used to uh, receive a subsidy, but then their income reached a threshold that now they no longer qualify for a subsidy, and now they're paying what we call a market rent, which is still below average market rents. Um, they are also guaranteed a right to return, and they are also guaranteed essentially the same rents that they were pay paying um, after be before they moved out. So uh, we we adjust it according to inflation. We'll increase it, you know, two percent for every year that they may have not been in that unit. But essentially, their rent will also be protected. Okay, that's very interesting. We have a big discussion in Sweden uh, when we renovate uh, the house from 1960. And the rents get so high that the people living there uh, cannot afford to to stay in their home anymore. So yeah, and I mean, I, I'm speaking of it from a social housing government lens, so we protect it. Uh, Toronto recently, well, the Ontario government recently passed a rent control uh, protection. So essentially all uh, private renters in the market are now have also access to rent control and they can't increase rents more than 2% uh, annually. Uh, we now have a conservative government that has come into power in the province. They've now modified that rent control to say any new uh, market uh, ownership housing that is provided in the, in the rental market after the day of the legislation, which I think was last week or two weeks ago, they no longer have rent control. So basically any housing that was rented prior to 2018 has a rent control now and any housing on the market, uh, private market side that is after 2018 will no longer have rent control. Okay, there's one question. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the presentations. I have just a question to Vince, to Morgan and to Anna and Anna. I'm very much interested in uh, um, who is driving, like, uh, which social groups and uh, uh, which uh, civil rights uh, movements are driving those issues uh, in Canada and the U.S. and in Stockholm, uh, since all these issues are very old, and in Germany as well, but uh, uh, since it's mostly it's minorities who are uh, the victims of discrimination, especially racial discrimination in the uh, housing market, uh, and uh, as a consequence, uh, it was not a big issue here, since the majority, the white, uh, was not that much affected. So I'm very much interested, how is it driven? Who is driving all those issues? Is that like the, the act, the anti-discriminatory act, which is uh, putting all these action strategic institutions, etc., because you need institutions at the end. Uh, this is a new phenomenon, this is a new discussion in Germany. Uh, but it's an old issue. So I'm very much interested uh, who is the driving power behind, behind all your policies. <laughs> Should okay, we start I, at I one can... end and sure. just move to the right? Um, so so I guess in the in in the Toronto context, it's a bit it's a bit unique. Um, we have a very uh, vocal tenant population, and they've really been the ones that have dri been driving the change. Um, I think we we experience some of the similar experiences as as my colleagues on this panel and and some of the people that I've spoken to over the the, the morning sessions. And that um, you know the Ontario Human Rights Code is only as strong as people that know how to use it. And so there are populations in in Toronto in in Toronto community housing that don't know that those service that those rights are protected. Um, so, but what we've been seeing is a lot of tenants then start gaining that knowledge, and then they start challenging those rules. Like so, for the accessibility uh, requirements, you know. TCHC, uh, you know, as great as we can show them off now, we weren't the drivers of that change. It was a group of 
tenants who had mobility challenges that were experiencing this on the ground in our units and they couldn't find units that met their needs and they challenged us to the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal and it required TCHC to create a policy and adapt. Um, I, think in the, I think in the United States, it's local fair housing centers are driving the enforcement work that I talked about um, in particular. Um, and that's uh, local fair housing centers that are largely funded through a federal grant program. It's a modest federal grant program of, I think, between 35 and $40 million for the whole country. But that really supports this network of local fair housing centers all over the country that um, that bring the the bulk of the fair housing enforcement cases that that are brought every year. Uh, when it comes to discrimination, I think uh, that it's the local anti-discrimination bodies and uh, uh, the Swedish Equality Ombudsman as well. But what what we can see that is that there is a lack of knowledge concerning what is discrimination. Uh, so we have to talk to the different stakeholders on the housing market about discrimination and, yeah, and, and also empower the, the civil society. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. And I'm afraid that we need to close the session because there's one more to come. I would thank you, particularly the ones that had a long way to Berlin to come here and to share your experience. Thank you very much. I am also discriminated against. You always talk about us, but you never talk to us. Uh, coming here so I can babble. Hello. My name is Gillette Aisha. Thank you. The interpreter tries to get this across. This is political cavalry. So. Interesting. You know, Germans always think we can only speak Turkish, but we can speak English, Spanish, Turkish, Arabic, Zaza, Kurdish. You know what I mean? It's very good that you're here. What was your name? Let me see. Morgan. Ah, like tomorrow. Huh? Okay. I like you had a long day and you all people das also ich muss noch mal in Deutsch reden. I think I have to switch to German. I'm getting confused here. So good that you're here. Oh God, I don't get a flat. Let me swear God, if I tell you what we Turks have to do to get a flat, honestly, you would start crying. You would take out your Kleenex and you would say, oh God, I feel terrible for you. So this is why you are here because you all know this already. But sometimes, you know, you were also talking about what is discrimination. Nobody really knows it. Actually, everybody knows it, but nobody wants to understand it. Everybody knows it. Honestly, since Gauland said that Boateng doesn't have to be or does, should not be my neighbor, everybody knows what discrimination is. It was announced publicly. This is the situation. So we have to find out why do you whites not want to live next to us? This is a good start, isn't it? So we have to find out what the problem is of these people who don't want to live next to people of color. So. What is the problem of the white man and woman? Because if I understand your problem, well, now the situation is as follows. So if you have black hair and you say you made a lot of money with 98 Döner Kebab stores, could be, and you buy a flat in a nice area and there are only blonde people with mansions. And on the very day when I move in, I reduce the real estate value of my neighbor's house because he's blonde and I'm black. Honestly, his value is going down because he's now living next to a foreigner. So the foreigners are coming, the value is going down. Honestly, isn't that a problem? How do you want to solve this with legislation? That's the thing. So I think we have to start somewhere because honestly, Morgan, what you said. And I, I, I tell you, I was shocked. Shock. How can people do this, you know, with this uh, uh, bloodline thing? Also jetzt Blutlinie und so, habt ihr mitgekriegt? Er hat gesagt Did you hear this, what he said about the bloodline? There is an act 
after this Katharina, whatever it was, a storm, hurricane. So you can only let your flat to relatives, but who has no flats? Us Turks. And who has a flat? You know what I mean? And this is psycho. This is pathetic. It really shocked me. And now, let me tell you how we sometimes try to get a flat. We have some tricks. My cousin, you know what she did? She was 19 and she wanted to move out. She wanted to be an emancipated white woman. You know what I mean? She wanted to get adjusted to the German society. She didn't get a flat. She had a job. She worked as a waitress. I mean, it's not the greatest job, but she did have a job. So she was looking for two years. She didn't get a flat. Do you know what she did? Very smart. She said she is homeless. So if you register as a homeless person, you can babble forever and say, I don't have a flat. You made me homeless. I have to sleep in the street under the bridge. I swear, she had a flat within 15 days. This is how it works. So the victim structures work very well. That's the only message I have. But this emancipated path is still tricky. It's still closed because nobody knows what discrimination is. Good that you mentioned this, sisters, because this is a very important thing. We have to talk about this because, you know, one says, stop crying, get out of your victim's role, because I say, See, if you don't give me a flat, I have to get myself a German who lies to you so that you give him a flat and I can move in with my 15 relatives. You know what I mean? That's the situation. Fortunately, they exist, these smugglers, so to speak, really. Without these smugglers, we wouldn't exist. And honestly, what is also clever, Germany, I mean, for homeless people, you cannot even be a homeless person anymore and live in quietness. In Dortmund, in the city of Dortmund, you are fined if you're homeless. If you're sleeping in the street, for instance, yeah, wasn't it in the news recently? If you're laying in the street and they find you, you're homeless, yes, now you get a fine. I don't understand the logic because homeless actually to me means that I have no money. That's all it means. Otherwise, you would have a home, wouldn't you? So how do they want to collect the fine? Doesn't make any sense. And then again, the advantage of this thought is the following. If I can't pay the fine, then I go to prison. Water, warm water, heating, meals three times a day, not so bad. No, wait a minute. Unless the big companies, hmm, if I have to work in a big company, I have to work like a slave. I have to work for Hilfiger and other textile stores. So the tactic as such is not so bad, but it's bad. How can I say it? It's difficult. See, I have a friend. She's also here today. She studied NASA. I don't know what you call this, something with a brain. And seriously, she was looking for a flat for 10 years. But she looks cute, doesn't she? Look at her. She looks so cute. Not even cute people get flats. You know what I mean? That is something you can't rely upon. Sex doesn't work anymore either. Sexy? No. We're done with this. Honestly, I don't know. Where do you live at the moment? Miss Ulrike? Aha, uh -huh, you're not part of the homeless community, fortunately. Okay, so you do have a place to live. And how did you get it? Who lets it to you? Can you get me one? A flat? No. Okay, so no smuggler potential there. I can see it. No criminal potential. Where do you live, sister? Are you a student? Do you live in a student home? Is it terrible? It's okay? You're older? Oh, really? You have to put on makeup, you know, you look way too young, it's a problem. <laughs> this is why we Turks put so much makeup on our skin. Why do we put blonde dye in our hair so that we get a chance for a one-room apartment for 800 euros? That's the reason. It's a huge problem. And Ontario, Canada, here's what I want to say. For the information, um, I have a question. You said we have to wait 10 years, yeah? But in these 10 years, I make 15 babies. Do they all have to wait 10 years? <laughs> <sighs> Only one. So no 150 years waiting. <sighs> Only one is okay. Okay, okay. That was an important question because I'm coming when they kick me out. You know what? I have to come. I have to be asylum seeker. I'm sorry. I wanted to come to you, but right now... <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Ah, ich weiß auch nicht. I don't know. We somehow have to solve the problem. Honestly, why don't we want to live with each other and next to each other? You know what? What is so difficult in Germany? We have a new thing because you are no longer potatoes. We have... People don't talk about like this over here. They say it's German or not German. But basically it's white and black. It's a system, you know? And we have to talk about this system. And this is what I do now. I make a progression uh, uh, help for German people. It's my job, okay? <sighs> Because we love them. Okay, they're good people. Also, um, ich wollte noch mal sagen, ich habe ihm erklärt. Okay. I do development aid for you because you have to undergo development. And how do we do this? We are all, also white, you know? It's hard, let me tell you. Your people go bananas at the moment, seriously. Yellowvest.com. Did you get this? Did you see what was happening in France? These are just the current developments. So what do we do with this now? I mean, now the right wing parties come up and who said uh, the conservative your conservative party fucked up everything let's be honest say how it is they had a good idea at first okay like the left or the greens here humanism or whatever and then you have the others the conservative camp and they destroy everything and this is exactly what is happening in our country too and how do we defend ourselves against them that is the issue how do we stick together i have a few ideas For instance, we could make sure that 50% of all house managements have Turks as staff. Hello, Mehmet Aslam, welcome to our house management. I know your problems. I know you need a kitchen which is closed because of your headscarf. I know this. You don't have to explain anything to me. And you don't have the pressure anymore. You are not the discriminating party anymore. And he has a job. And the other has a flat. Hey, it works. This is just one idea of very many ideas that I have, but this is something that we could do. Or what else could we do? Let me think. Or we could really try harder and talk about this very dirty word. Do you know the bad word? Racism. And you know why this had be has become so evil? Because if most people don't know what discrimination is and what victim role is. It's what? Because when you discriminate, the other is in victim role. And when you in victim role, the other one is dis discriminating. So who is right now? Wer hat jetzt das Recht? So who is right? And I think that the core of humanism says that those are right who are abandoned or neglected. I mean, isn't that true? Okay, 53 million or billion tax fraud. Who is right? The person who ripped you off or you because you're crying? Tell me. It's not that difficult. It's a very easy equation. So who is the weakest in the story and the weakest? I mean, this is the person you have to focus on, this person you have to foster because you will die out, sister. You know what I mean? You don't produce more of yourselves. But if we produce more of ourselves because we are this expanding community, then you have to dye your hair dark because you will go crazy. You know what I mean? You will say, ah, there are these just highlights, very cheap, but you will do it, believe me. Well, these are things that we all have to think about. But what I like is that you come together. I have great respect in my heart for this. I have to say, really, and not because you feared, or you could be feared, um, but uh, you're not. You do it because you think it's right in your heart. And we feel this. And I think support and, and uh, to do something together, we have to do together. Next time you call me, listen, we have a problem. We need a case that we can bring for judge. You know what I mean? I say, no problem. I know 80 trillion million cases. I say so, is it worked? That's it. I want to say thank you. So I would like to say thank you. Did you get this? This the Turk with Abitur with A levels and glasses? Do you get what I'm saying? Well, he, behind you, there's a clone sitting. Hello, brother. Marco Polo. Oh God, I'm dying. Why a Marco Polo shirt? Hey, we wear Gucci shirts. Haven't you noticed this? Please adjust. I mean, you're drifting apart here. But you know what helps 
sometimes when you call somebody and you say, I want to have a flare head, you say, hey, I vote for the CDU, for the Conservative Party. And if they are not satisfied, you say CSU, which is even further to the right. And if this is not enough, you say AFD, right wing party. And sometimes this helps. Or I sometimes pretended that I was blind because I was thinking then he feels empathy and I will get the flat. And the landlord saw me and I was totally in my blind role. I was totally blind. And then I heard, no, you will not get the flat. And then I was so angry. You know, sometimes you are totally in your role. I was blind. I totally forgot that his head went right into my knee. I really didn't feel this. What can you do? Sometimes you have no choice. Have you ever looked for a flat like this, sister? Honestly, no. Do you have a flat? Okay, okay, so and so. Okay. But it's not good enough. It is good enough. But where does the but come from? Aha, uh -huh, it's not really your flat. So you haven't taken on. Mary, really, it doesn't matter, Mary. Then you will get the flat in court once you're divorced. But this is a different issue. I would like to thank you. That was it from my side. Gillette Aisha says bye-bye. Have a nice evening. Thank you for your solidarity. Bye-bye. So. Vielen Dank, uh, Gillette Aisha. Thank you, Gillette Aisha. Especially for guests from abroad and who do not know her, let me briefly introduce her. Ida Luna Baidar is comedian, actress, and social influencer. In December 2011, she uploaded her first videos on YouTube um, using her artificial figures for her social criticisms. And after she got more than a million clicks in 2014, she developed her first comedy program. And she's been on stage ever since and also on te television as is her role um, in her role as Aisha in various internet formats in 2015. She received a special award for integration and tolerance of the capital of Berlin and is also the Emna Visa of the Stuttgart Broom 2016. Thank you, Aisha. After this more playful interlude, um, we will now have some more work to do and hope we will also get some political support on the issues which we discussed earlier. Even though I know something different, I would like to take the floor anyway to present the um, outcome of the discussions for the guideline fair renting in Berlin. The outcome of the discussions this afternoon, the Office for Discrimination or Against Discrimination on the Housing Market has the anti-discrimination law and it is active in a housing market which was described today. So we only have limited instruments to do something about discrimination on the housing market or to support preventive measures which might guarantee access of people suffering from discrimination. What can you do in this case? You try to make a commitment, a common understanding of instruments of a political position vis-a-vis -vis this topic. We decided to propose a guideline, fair renting in or fair letting in Berlin and who should commit to this guideline? What might be the target? Vision is very clear. Equal treatment when it comes to access to the housing market, that is what the anti-discrimination law and other equality laws require, but also equal treatment in the tenancy. We've seen this again, that um, landlord be, uh, behavior vis-a-vis -vis tenants. So 
that this is oriented towards equal treatment and also in neighborhood conflicts that the opponents are treated equally by the landlord, for example, if he gets involved, so uh, social workers, whoever would tries to help in such a conflict. What would be the mission first to get all stakeholders um, should identify with the ob target of equal treatment on the housing markets? Um, so it's them making just taking decisions in politics, administration and the housing market. Equal treatment as values in companies of landlords. So we took both perspectives of housing companies and of individual landlords should be defined individually at all in the associations and communicated internally and externally. And the third mission is concrete instruments and structures that should be developed to implement these values and the guideline in both political and economic activities on the housing markets and these instruments and structures should be made visible through this guideline. What will we do? So we looked at role models, examples. There are not that many for such a guideline. North Rhine-Westphalia tried to launch one and there's one municipality, the city of Nuremberg, which has launched such a guideline and has received broad commitment of the varied housing sector. We involved our first advisory council for the discussion on this guideline, what should be in it, who should commit to it. We started today with this conference to involve international and national experts in the development of this guideline and with we would also develop a draft with other actors of the housing sectors and then we um, I'm curious to see who will be um, the first to sign it and we're looking to big housing associations first. So today we started and the series of organizations of conferences will last till February that and we hope that in February, uh, sorry, in spring 2019, we can start with the implementation. What have we discussed? We had five working groups which discussed the five topics which we thought were relevant. The first was integrated housing concepts. And here we learned um, mix creates mix um, of different forms of housing, social mix, and also integration of different funding and subsidy models trigger also a social, good social mix. We need deeply rooted standards. In Berlin, there are already three guidelines either developed or uh, in the pipeline for participation. Also, the housing sector in a trial lock approach developed a participation strategy. The question is how much serious participation can be guaranteed, how much decision making is possible, what can be brought together and what was very important that right from the beginning a number of stakeholders are involved, not only the housing um, company and the social welfare office, but also social educational actors and others. The uh, workshop that looked into um, the living, um, well, the housing political instruments at allocation policy. One aspect which does not have that much to do with allocation management, but with the design of new housing political approaches to increase the non-profit share in housing projects to have um, an open, transparent and need oriented advice for the allocation procedure, which should be the basis and to um, secure affordable housing for all. That should be part of the guideline, which shows the variety or the diversity of actors because a lot of these questions our issues are up to decision makers, are other up to the industry, some are more process oriented. So let's look at what's diversity management um, in 
housing companies discussed, um, it would be necessary to have more transparency in the selection criteria. So, uh, living starts with moving in and with corporation structures and with support for groups which need or might need this special support. And this does not only apply to people of non-German origin. The idea is of a social mix to exclude people from access to certain neighborhoods, certain houses, which is not written down anywhere. So together we might discuss what does it mean in times as these? Diversity management in companies. Um, so the general assumption was still in its infancy. So the task is to further develop is cooperation between anti-discrimination advice agencies and housing companies in Berlin, organizations, um, offices such as ours, and the v diversity of the, the various landlords. The idea was to strengthen the anti-discrimination law that it really becomes the basis for housing activities, not in terms of how can I defend best certain tenant groups, but how can I strengthen tenants' rights and to communicate it internet excellence, trainings, testing, allocation um, instruments should be used. We do not need to develop them, just name them to set the framework for the commitment. And we should also make it transparent who uh, um, submitted or signed this commitment um, to strengthen the anti-discrimination law. And here on the panel, we discussed how anti-discrimination can be used to give justice to people. The working group which discussed it said that we need transparent selection criteria and to make them public as a reference framework for people who have the feeling they were discriminated against, to establish a monitoring mechanism for allocation procedures or to make it accessible to housing companies and for the general public, and something like a letting, to develop a kind of letting certificate. So if certain If you commit to certain um, tenancy processes, you get can get a certain certificate that you are part, which certifies that you're part of the group of fair landlords. That was a brief summary of our discussion this afternoon, but it's also meant to be the basis or the kickoff for the political um, talking route. The host will be State Secretary for Consumer Protection, Martin Gokschalt, whom I would like to um, welcome to the panel. We are happy that the ministry, which has given us the mandate, is also here today. And I would also like to invite the other guests to the panel. Sebastian Schill, Berlin State Secretary for Housing, the Senate Department for Urban Development and Housing. And I would also like to invite Sibyl Schulz. the head of the Refugee Management Department of the Senate Department for Integration, Work and Social Affairs. Heike Fritsche, consultant for research and policy matters at the Federal Anti-Discrimination Agency. And Mario Higgenfels, the head of the Housing Industry and Policy Department at the Berlin-Brandenburg Federation of Housing Associations. And Doris Liebscher, research associate at the law faculty of the Humboldt University Berlin, the law clinic of Berlin. And with this, Mrs. Gottschein, I will hand over the microphone to you as tonight's hostess and chair. Can you hear me? That was my question. Are the chairs enough or shall I stay standing? Well, there is still, there are enough chairs now. Well, 
Thank you and welcome you all to this discussion round. Um, I look forward to and I would like to thank those who have organized this important meeting today. I think it's been an awful lot of work and I hope that we will have a productive exchange. In this panel discussion, we would like to focus on the situation in Berlin after we've heard things, what is possible in other cities of the world. And we heard also about the something about the legal framework conditions for those who joined us. I would like to say a few words on the legal framework. In Germany, we have the anti-discrimination law or equality law, which is the implementation of EU norms, which is on the one hand a basis, but when it comes to housing and the housing market has limitations which uh, allow more exemptions than general rules. One would be that it only applies for mass transactions or um, rela business relations where landlords have more than 50 units and that there is an exemption of discrimination which is not allowed according to this law when it comes to social, cultural and a stable housing environment and a mix shall be guaranteed through this this was um, rather free summary of section 19 of the anti-discrimination law. So my question to the panelists, in particular to those who are legal experts, I would like to ask the following. Let me start with Dorit Liebsche. What are the options you see, even though there are these limitations for Berlin to get some input for a discrimination fee policy. Can you all hear me? I think Berlin, as the whole of Germany, as in the last 10 years, ever since we've had this anti-discrimination law, has received a lot of input by this due to the fact that we have this law. Uh, I, as my former colleague Anke Fritschke in Saxony, we made a contribution to the launch of this law and the discussion which we are having today and the panel which we have here would not have been possible 10 years ago the discussion to organize this conference, uh, Senate administration, which has anti-discrimination in its name. We have because of this anti-discrimination law at this symbolic level, at a general level, um, um, we owe a lot to the law in terms of fair treatment and integration, a culture of anti-discrimination. When I'm hearing about Toronto, for example, I think if we look at the stairways to heaven, it's still heaven. But nevertheless, I think we are in Berlin at least achieved at phase two. Not in Saxony, but in Berlin, we have the institutions, we have the commitment, and we have a very lively and active civil society. And excellent tenant networks who can help to implement this law and breathe life into it. So I'd say it's very beneficial. But despite all this positive input, there is also a bitter truth um, to take up at what Alexander Pischgerit presented here, that we do not have a lot of litigation in the field of housing discrimination. And Gittishman mentioned 18 cases, which you'll find if you look at the most important legal databases. If, however, you look into the details and see which cases really cover 
discrimination on the housing market in the context of the anti-discrimination law, but there's also cases of job center discrimination, etc. So I did it today. You can find about 10 cases, which is very little compared to cases which we find in the field of discrimination on the labor market. And if we look at these cases further, we find something very interesting. Most of these cases are racial discrimination, which is a very special because usually we do not have a lot of litigation. We have this much um, trust in the law, etc. Why do we have so many of these cases of racial discrimination? One reason is because in the field of racial discrimination, um, here the exemption of mass business does not apply. So we see um, the field of application of the law is necessary that um, as a precondition to enable litigation. And that is the question of how to implement the law. These were all cases in which anti-discrimination offices, advice offices supported these um, litigation. So you see how difficult it is you get justice. And the anti-discrimination law is a law intended to claim your individual right or that your individual right was violated, as we heard it. Um, the demand of um, class action was meant that individual persons have to be supported. And as a last point, they need special support in a constellation in which the it's very difficult to provide evidence for, um, for discrimination, which is very often the case on the housing market. And which brings us to the question which we'll discuss later, what kind of support structures do we need to make it easier to prove it? So testing um, procedures, for example. Thank you, Mrs. Liebscher. That was uh, to the force, if you like. So my question now goes to the federal level. Mrs. Fritsche, you work for the Federal Anti-Discrimination Agency. You heard about the opportunities of the anti-discrimination law, supporting structures that are required. Do you agree with Mrs. Liebscher and what she said raised, such as testing procedures, creating more supportive structures? And I also heard something about a possible um, law amendment, which we in Berlin would certainly support. Do you agree with her or do you have other ideas? What is the federal perspective if you look at Germany? Or maybe you have some good ideas which we might implement in Berlin. Well, we definitely share this perspective, the perspective that Ms. Liebscher presented. So all the points that you have mentioned are relevant. The deficits of Section 19 is basically what it comes down to regarding the protection from discrimination in the area of housing, the missing class action. I mean, these are also diagnoses that our agency has made. And on, regular, on a regular basis, we report to the German parliament and we recommend to do away with these deficits and to also do away with sentence three, the formulation balanced settlement conditions. So we don't like this term and it has to be abolished. So when it comes to tips and recommendations in terms of, well, what else could be done? Of course, it is always worth looking at other legal groups and legal areas. So in order to close the gaps of the act, it makes sense to take a look at symbiosis in the area of consumer protection law and other areas. Let me give you an example. When it comes to the complaints that we get and that the independent anti-discrimination agencies and offices get, it's not just discriminating against people on the housing market, but it is also racist mobbing amongst neighbors where this act does not work at all. It's a matter of the criminal code. It's probably also a matter of the civil code. So it was worth, it would be worth figuring out to what extent we can also use other laws. Unfortunately, the anti-discrimination agency does not have a lot of leeway. We don't have the mandate as a national anti-discrimination agency. 
to accompany people in court or to also file lawsuits ourselves in order to close this gap. Other national equality bodies have that, but we don't. And this would reduce the load of the individuals to a certain extent at least. Now, if you take a look at the interfaces, it's also worth looking at other legal areas in order to remedy and mitigate this lack of litigation. So where can we increase the possibility to take people and landlords to court. So there's a huge deficit when it comes to legal execution, when it comes to executing individuals' rights, extrajudicial arbitration, complaint management, testings and other measures to prove discrimination are words that come to mind in this context. So these are all things that are in the interest of many persons affected that do not want to go to court. So legal framework is one thing, but legal execution, strengthening the individual's legal rights, I mean, these would be very important measures and activities. Thank you very much. Now let us change the area or level and let us focus on the title of our panel discussion, Developing a Guideline for Berlin, Fair Letting Practices. Okay, so we have federal law. We also have other legal areas and laws and acts. But we would say that we need to change this law, Germany's General Equal Treatment Act. And we will also file a motion in Parliament next year, but let's wait and see what is going to happen with this. Because for this initiative in Parliament, we of course need political majorities in both chambers of our Parliament, that is. And honestly, I don't see these majorities nowadays. And then we have these questions of testings, setting up supporting structures, etc. I'm sure that certain measures can be taken in order to do this and achieve this. If there are cases where people are really discriminated against. Now, what we want to do with this guideline or legal framework embarks upon the legal preven preventative path. So how do we develop systems to avoid discriminating practices before they actually happen. And this is a path that not just our administration has embarked upon, but also other agencies, the Berlin real estate industry that is also represented here today, and other experts. They all have joined forces in order to develop such a framework. And here is my question for the colleague of the Berlin government, Sebastian Scheel. And it's wonderful to have you here on the panel. And I would now like to include you in the discussion. So in, Ber in the Berlin Senate, you have a certain degree of influence on the urban housing associations. So what do you think about such a mission statement? Is this a good approach? And what should we consider when it comes to its implementation. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's wonderful to be here tonight. And it's great that we can discuss these issues with each other. And Berlin's housing associations find this very important as well. A common commitment is what this mission statement is comes down to, and that's the right approach, because we do see that we have to act legally. And the legal framework we have at the moment curtails our activities. You wouldn't believe how many letters I get from tenants. It's not only about discrimination, but it's about all kinds of other issues and challenges that tenants have. And the problem always is these are civil right issues. Everybody has to execute their own rights, so we cannot really advise them. We can just send them brief answers. So it is up to the individual to take associations or landlords to court. And we try to support people, also people who cannot afford certain things. We have tenants associations that support these tenants so that at least the cost is covered, so that everybody can use their right to get counseling. Together with Berlin's housing associations, we concluded a cooperation agreement that goes beyond 
legal issues. When it comes to people who are entitled to get a flat that is subsidized by the state, there is a lot of there are a lot of things that still need to be done and improved. We do have a control element with this certificate that people get who are entitled to get social housing. And it actually works pretty well in Berlin, I have to tell you, because we have 300,000 housing units in Berlin that I own are owned by Berlin's housing associations. We want to increase this to 400,000. And I mean, there is turnover, 15,000 flats were sort of put on the market last year. So we built new flats every year and 60%, which is nine and a half thousand flats that people get who are entitled to live in socially and s subsidized flats. And of course, this also protects a certain market segment. And if you are a homeless person, for instance, you are confronted with huge barriers, and this is also a program for them. About 90% of flats in the protected market segment are owned by Berlin's housing association. So, of course, they also assume a certain role model. At least we hope that they play this role model role. But especially in Berlin, where people can make a lot of money with flats, the role model function is limited. We know that. Also, without having great commitments in the letting practice itself, we managed to also include refugees to a great extent. There is a high share of refugees that now get their own flats once they are entitled to getting social benefits. And with our support and help, with soft pressure, you could also say they accept this job. And they try to make sure that when it comes to existing buildings and flats, there is a social mix. So they try to guarantee a social mix. Diversity management has been mentioned earlier. And I don't think that we are there yet. But when it comes to social mix, a lot of things have already been achieved. So I do think that if the political will is there, we, together with the associations, can make more change happen, positive change. Thank you. That sounds actually very hopeful. Let's wait and see. Mr. Hilgenfeld, you represent the Berlin-Brandenburg Federation of Housing Associations. So you sort of complete the picture here. Sebastian Scheer represents the city housing associations, and you now represent the privates. What do you think about chances and opportunities and risks of such a mission statement that we want to develop? Is it being discussed in your organization? And do you think that this eventually makes sense? Well, it's scotch time. Thank you very much for the invitation, ladies and gentlemen. But now I can say that we are still in a process. We haven't yet achieved things. The mission statement has to be developed. We are still in a phase of work in progress. And it depends on how concrete the mission statement will eventually be. Will it be a new benchmark for companies? Earlier on, you mentioned that in Germany, compared to other countries, we have a lot of regulation. Constitutionally speaking, we have certain norms in our constitution. We have criminal norms. We have the Federal General Equal Treatment Act. We also have acts at the regional level. Mr. Scheel just mentioned that cities or Berlin has a, an act and other regulations and rules. I think that it is necessary to talk about market developments first, to talk about problems that we are confronted with on the market. And what we have learned today, thanks to our international guests, is that metropolis are confronted with similar problems. So it is a global challenge that we are discussing here. Very important learning because we need, live in times of metropolization. And we have to ask ourselves, how are people going to live together in metropolis in the future? And if this is a multicultural coexistence, and if this is what we want, then we have to talk about new mission statements and guiding principles. How we put them into practice, these mission statements, 
remains to be seen. It's still too early to describe them. I think we should focus on the process first. We have to embark upon this path together with companies and associations. Otherwise, we make a declaration, everybody signs it, and nothing happens. What has just been referred to is what I'm alluding at. We have good laws, yet we suffer from a deficit of execution. So before I adopt new laws, I tend to ask, can't we improve the laws that we are already that we already have? And in this context, the mission statement could help us. So to improve the existing General Equal Treatment Act, to fill the act with life, so to speak, and to make it more tangible for companies and associations. Thank you. I'm sure that we will come back to this point later. But I would now also like to include Ms. Schulz. She is the one who focuses on a very specific target group. You intensively deal with the situation of refugees and their situation on the housing market. So based on your experiences with your target group, so to speak, what do we need to do? What measures have to be taken? And what are the needs of this target group? And how can their needs be reflected in such a mission statement? Thank you very much for the invitation. We deal with a very specific target group, that is refugees in Berlin. So it's very Berlin specific. We try to figure out how we can improve their access to the housing market. But we also try to figure out how we can improve the quality in the camps or centers. We are talking about 23,000 refugees that live in so-called refugee facilities or camps here in Berlin. This is families, this is singles, this is different people. And we're about 11,000 of them have received a specific status, yet they still live in these camps and facilities because they have not yet gotten access to the housing market. And this has different reasons and there are different barriers. And we support these people. So we founded a roundtable together with Mr. Scheel and our Under Secretary of State. And we got together four times in 2018 and we tried to identify these barriers. Why don't people get, why don't refugees get access to the housing market? How are they discriminated against? And this varies. So the Federal Authority for Refugee Issues has placed 2,000 people in different flats. Of course, this is not enough because we have 23,000 refugees living in Berlin still in these centers and camps, yet this is an improvement. And these people waited for a flat for 23 weeks. But please take a look at all the others. And we have set up all kinds of different bodies on this topic. And if you listen to their stories, then I have to say that people normally work much, much longer than 23 weeks, especially those who have families. We do not have enough housing for these people, affordable housing with multiple rooms. And of course, they tell totally different stories when it comes to waiting times. Having said that, we need a mission statement that focuses on solutions and that identifies the specific barriers for refugees, but also for other disadvantaged groups. But I think a central and a key point is good counseling structures. Mr. Scheel mentioned them. This is exactly what we need. At the round table, we said we also need a central ombudsman, also for landlords, for housing associations that are willing to make change happen, yet are also confronted with barriers. There's a lack of information on their part. What does this mean regarding the status? What do I have to consider? Do I get my security deposit back, etc.? So we need to educate, and we also need counseling in the refugees' native languages and materials that have to be translated. Not everybody can learn German that quickly. And when it comes to concluding a lease, then we have also identified many barriers. People don't understand what the paragraphs really say. So we said we need a lease in simple language. The lease has to be concluded in German. So we try to identify these barriers. And in the context of the round table where we have different decision makers meeting, 
we did this, but we also have representatives of the support structures and representatives of housing associations. So we try to figure out where best practice models exist. What can we learn from each other? What can we use in Berlin? Because there are numerous projects in the different districts here that offer many support services also services in different languages. We have to reduce the barriers and we also put on our agenda that we take a look at the protected market segment and also the entitlement to get subsidized housing for those who do not yet have a secured residence status. Thank you. I understand you as you're saying that we need a mission statement, not just regarding specific targets, but you're saying that we also need very concrete measures, activities, instruments. They also have to become part of such a mission statement. And my impression is that what you said about your target group, that is refugees, can be also translated into other contexts. So ethnic, national origin, is what it comes down to also in other contexts. This is what I hear from Vermieten Verwohnen offices. It is also about bigger families, they told me. And there are no bigger flats. These flats are no longer built or they are now shared by different families. This also affects people who are not necessarily refugees. So my question is the following, and it is a question for the two gentlemen here on the panel. So when thinking about the mission statement, what are potential goals? Not just goals, but also potential measures. So. Would you support such measures? Could you even say, yes, the city's housing associations could reduce and eliminate these barriers and fill such a mission statement with life and eventually sign it? Yeah. Well, it depends on the measures and activities, of course. I mean, there we have formulated a few questions already. I mean, also the Housing for Refugees segment, the 285 flats that are managed by the Regional Authority for Refugees, the LAF. And if I understood it correctly, there are also bigger flats, bigger flats being built, more bigger flats than had originally been planned. And Berlin used to be a city with many single households or households that were shared by two people. So there has always been a very strong focus on these two target groups. And now we have families who have many kids and of course they also need to get flats. And this does not work with the current system. I mean, if you have five people, then you get five rooms. This is the original German system. People would be happy if they got four rooms, but it doesn't work that easily in Germany. Everything is pretty complex. But these issues need to be treated and dealt with. What have we done? When it comes to new social housing, we focus on greater flats so that we can create and build bigger flats so that we can meet these needs. It's not that easy. Everything needs to be operationalized. And if you do that, you can make progress. First of all, we need to define goals, though, and then we have to derive the activities. And if you want to pursue and achieve these goals, I'm also willing to talk about greater quotas. If you really want to talk about quotas, this is a case of affirmative action at the end of the day. But in times where so many people are still in camps or live in camps and do not get out there because there are many administrative hurdles, we will definitely need affirmative discrimination quotas, at least for a certain period of time, so that we get decent occupancy rates and get these people out of the reception centers. So I think we can commit ourselves to this. And there's another issue that we have to master. How can we achieve integration into, in the neighborhoods? So what is a good mix? That is the ultimate question. And this is something that we have to think about. 
just saying freedom of discrimination, everybody who comes to us is welcome. I think this is too easy. It's easier said than done. But I'm very happy to have a dialogue with Berlin's housing associations, and I do see a willingness to talk about this. I mean, there is an issue out there. We have many people who are entitled to housing. We have refugees who are entitled to housing. We have 35,000 documents certifying the eligibility to rent subsidized rental units. We have 15,000 new housing units being built every day, uh, sorry, every year. So the massive demand that is increasing and that it's going to continue to increase cannot be covered and met with existing buildings and housing. Deutsche Wohnen was one of the housing associations that participated in the round table. It is one of the biggest representatives. I think I can do name dropping here. And we have to raise awareness for the private players. They also have to make a contribution. And this is what we also can expect from one of the biggest landlord in the city. They are private and these private companies also bear responsibility for social cohesion in the city and country. Thank you. I take this as the first positive outcome, a commitment of the public housing associations, and even though we should still discuss the details. Thank you. Mr. Hildenfeld, what is the position of private housing companies. In contrast to what Mr. Scheel said on the municipal housing associations, the cooperatives in Berlin, which 10 or 12 percent of market share, are part of the sector oriented towards common good, and here it's more difficult. Cooperatives are self-organized. You cannot prescribe anything. The selection of tenants is done according to very comprehensive lists of criteria, primarily to members of the cooperative who've been a member for a while and family members of them um, to sign shares of the cooperative. Every cooperative has a different setting to get an apartment. Generally, you could say the rents which we have might be appropriate to fit to low income groups. So the are similar to subsidized flats between four euro fifty and six euros, we have really cheap rents, which is not the question. But you cannot prescribe the rules or the criteria. You first need a discussion process and negotiation process of the cooperatives, internal process of the cooperatives. The same applies to big private companies, headquarters, lay down these structures. And for that, we need a very intensive dialogue first, which wasn't done in the past. Well, you thought you could um, set up rules and prescribe, uh, prescribe things. You need a dialogue that Vonovia, for example, last week in Rheinickendorf announced a new project. If you've seen it in the press, 600 new flats will be built. And I think there's also a contract signed with the city. So it's a commitment of Vonovia, the largest German housing company. And you might also talk with them about the awarding criteria, how you can guarantee discrimination-free access to these Houses. I cannot tell you how it will be done because we need the process first. Let me probe this because we want to launch this process and you are on board and we are happy if also private companies get involved. Give us a hint or two or three. What do we need to convince private real estate companies. What do we need? It's a tricky question because the Berlin cooperatives, I 
think of an ideal city if you have this stairway to he to heaven. A city consisting only of cooperatives, 100% of a cooperatives. Would it be great? I think it would be great. It would be fantastic looking at the rents, which would be possible. And how can we achieve it? At the moment, cooperatives are losing market share. They have 10 to 12 percent. Last year, 15,000 apartments were built, but cooperatives um, finished only five to 600. So they built only one third of what they needed to maintain the market share, which they have in the Berlin market. So they're losing market share. They're not going upstairs, but downstairs. So when I want to take cooperatives on board, I need to create the precondition that their cooperatives can grow. Good land to build houses on is necessary, and we also need an exchange. We had these um, cooperative dialogues with the senator and with Mr. Scheel, where we showed which framework conditions might be interesting to cooperatives for new construction projects, for refurbishment, for subsidies to support and appreciate cooperatives. And if the frameworks are right, cooperatives will be ready to do things what you raised, how do you allocate houses in particular for vulnerable groups? This is an intrinsic part of demands. When um, you would get tax money, for whom is it? Whom do you support? Now it's linked to the income level if you're entitled to get a subsidized flat. But we also have a um, we have social targets group which have specific needs. You can define this, but for that you need to design the um, subsidy structure that cooperatives become interested in this. There is still a lag. The big private companies very clearly, I think, as Deutsche Wohnen was mentioned, in initiatives to um, nationalize private companies are counterproductive. What would you do as a company if you're permanently confronted to be um, blamed to be a real estate shark? So then you would close and let the others solve it. If you want to keep the doors open and want to keep talking in a new construction project, such as in Charlottenburg in Berlin, should see what you could do to achieve something with Deutsche Wohnen to get also some flats for vulnerable groups. You might come to an agreement, and then this might be a positive example which you could roll out with the largest private company in Berlin. And if we had the biggest on our side, a lot of smaller ones might follow suit. Thank you. We've heard a lot about obstacles and preconditions which the state had to set up to make private companies to get involved in such a process. I do not want to have a mere dialogue, uh, and that is why I would like to ask Mrs. Liebscher to comment on the obstacles, demands made. How do you see this? What do you think about the readiness with respect to the public and the private sectors in terms of an anti-discrimination policy and discrimination-free awarding of flats? I personally would like to raise the question and the idea of fair renting. What is it actually? We talked a lot about the social question. And my experience is, and the experience of advisory services and people who do not look German, also rich and wealthy people are discriminated against. 
and this is also a problem we need to address. And that is why I think in Berlin, we have a very tense housing market, which makes it easy for landlords to take some time. But we also have a very tense discrimination situation. And here the state is responsible to protect people from discrimination. And for that, we need a very strong understanding of human rights. And not everything is rosy. We need a discussion. And I understand if Deutsche Wohnen joins the discussion, but we cannot close our eyes vis-a-vis -vis the reality of discrimination in our city and nationwide. And I think we will not achieve in 10, 20, or 100 years to have a discrimination-free society. We need to learn to deal with discrimination. And I think a guideline or mission statement should include this, what to do about discrimination. So people who are in a vulnerable situation, who are discrimination prone, get support to get their rights or to make sure that they get their rights. Where do we stand against the background of the international experience um, that was shared here today? My impression is that in Germany we have a situation in which tenant law is stronger and better than in the US or the UK. The anti-discrimination law, however, is much weaker. And that is why I wouldn't say that we have good anti-discrimination laws. We have an anti-discrimination law. The Fair Housing Act in the US is of 1966. The anti-discrimination law is of 2006. And between that, we have ha centuries between. Um, and we cannot just wait for it to come. We need to s start acting to keep our face um, on the global market. I think we should urgently act in terms of our anti-discrimination law in Germany. And I think you said it, positive discrimination. Legally, I'd say I wouldn't call it positive discrimination, but to compensate for negative discrimination. In a very competitive situation of the housing market, um, people who do not have the, do not find level playing fields because they might be gay or might have, um, uh, might be black or have three children, which is not acceptable. And we have to um, do something. Affirmative action is not positive discrimination. It's road towards less discrimination. And I'd wish that in our mission statement, to use also discrimination sensitive language with to agree that we we know that there is discrimination we can talk about it very calm it we have it everywhere it's not an accusation we want to tackle it together and for that we need positive measures to help people or support people who are more prone to the discrimination within others. And we might help them that they're individually treated better in order to change the structure. And I think there will be dis won't be distortions in neighborhood if it's linked to a um, community in neighborhoods, which we have in, in Berlin, which is a beautiful thing. And all these initiatives um, should be involved um, if we set up such a mission shelter. And there won't be any upheaval in the neighborhood because a certain block will um, give flats to people with disability. Thank you, Mrs. Liebscher, also for your statement that we need to tackle the law. We won't be an obstacle, and we will certainly be able to pass it um, at a political level. Um, I just wanted to say something which I forgot to say. There are also areas with discrimination, not only between private actors, as we heard by Mrs. Fletcher. Um, so, so discrimination among neighbors is a big topic. Um, that should also be part of the mission statement because we need a discrimination sensible and competent conflict management in housing associations, for instance, because I know this 
there is still a lack of skills and capacities and we do not have an appropriate structure. And it should also be part of the um, tenancy laws and of the housing rules so that there sh we can also prevent discrimination among neighbors. And also when the entitlement letters for subsidized houses are granted, we should make sure that it's discrimination free. And next year, as the plan is, we will have a state anti-discrimination law. And I'm really curious to see what we will see then. Thank you very much for your idea. To all those who do not know, we are currently preparing a state anti-discrimination law, which is now going through the legislative procedure step by step. We hope that in January we will now have the first signatures and in um, early next year the government will look into it and this law will for the first time regulate um, the relationship between state action and citizens. Um, we do not have this in any other German state. That might also be a starting goal, but only for state action for ac administrative actions. So the entitlement for subsidized flats, that might be concerned here. Now I would like to get the federal perspective on board. I would like to ask the head of the Federal Anti-Discrimination Agency, um, do you know any other state municipality to put other actors into the fore and looking at the discussion here? What would you recommend to take up in our mission statement. A process which was triggered in Berlin is unique in Germany, and that is why we are observing the process with great interest. As you said, our anti discrimination law is a reactive law. Those who are affected by discrimination can get satisfaction or paid damages and won't get the flat, which is not attractive to implement anti-discrimination protection. And Berlin has seen this problem and sees where can it act proactively, preemptively to make a contribution to fair renting. And this mission statement, the guideline might be an element for fair renting. It's just one element of a fair housing or renting culture. Culture comprises more than non-discrimination. It has a huge symbolic value that state says we've been proactive, preemptive. What can we do to let housing fairly? And we think it is already very positive to have embarked along this road, which is even more important than reaching the objective. That is what the mission statement can do to start a dialogue with various stakeholders to have an exchange on these aspects that has, um, will rise awareness. It might also motivate people, might also have an integration effect to work on something with an open ending and whether it will take effect will depend on its design and setup, how many actors are around the table, how concrete it will be, how transparent the process will be, how the mission statement will be made public, how it's used, um, whether there will be monitoring, controlling. We do not yet know. But that you've embarked upon this road has already had an impact on the housing sector, which might not have started to tackle it. And that is what you can do. It's just a guideline, a mission statement, not more, not less. So you can't solve with it all our problems. But nevertheless, let me say something what you said, Mr. Hildenfeld. I think it's a bit difficult to say that you need to offer something to cooperatives so that they will be ready to open up to vulnerable groups. This does 
not concern discrimination. Um, cooperatives have to abide by anti-discrimination legislation, and there is a number of cases in which cooperatives um, discriminated against people, saying we do not want to have this or that group as members of the cooperatives. For that, you do not, not need to involve them into the development of the mission statement. That is something um, or cooperatives have to abide by the law as private or public actors. Thank you very much for this. My question in view of the specific target group of refugees, I don't know if you can say anything about it, but Doris Liebsch's remarks with respect to positive discrimination to compensate for negative discrimination. What has been your experience and do you think this approach might be helpful? I think any approach to disclose barriers is important and needed. We have very different target groups also within the group of refugees, like within the entire society. And what I see is that women clearly say that they don't get any chance in the area of integration. And if I want to talk about successful integration, I have to specifically focus on women. The Berlin situation is better compared to the other federal states. We have child care here. So people who live in these facilities and are willing to learn German and to look for a flat need child care services. They need good flats and housing conditions in order to learn and study. So this is a group that feels disadvantaged and discriminated against because they have to stay in these facilities for such a long time. And women told us that they go to 20, 30, 50 different flats and because they have multiple kids, because they don't speak German well enough, they are being discriminated against when looking at these flats. And if I hear this, then I have to focus on this target group and I have to develop actions in order to focus on them even more to improve their access. This is just one target group. We don't even know how many people coming to Germany are discriminated against because of other physical, mental needs or disabilities. Our system is not enough to cover all these needs. And I hear this again and again when it comes to looking for flats. So how can I identify these factors? How can I study them more comprehensively? How can I eliminate these barriers at the end of the day? So any tool that deals with the barriers, be it language barriers, origin-related related barriers, be it the status, be it specific individual barriers, is decisive. This is what we have to do. This is basically what I have experienced with our target groups. And we focus more on families and women because they can articulate themselves better. Now, to wrap up, one very last round. And I would like to ask you to mention the most important argument that you use in your housing association, in your Senate administration, in your advice center, at your round table. So how would you advertise such a mission statement, fair letting practices in rental housing in Berlin. How would you market it? Which one argument would you use? Sebastian, thank you. Well, I think it comes down to responsibility. We bear responsibility as politicians and we also have to tell the housing associations that they also bear responsibility. This is a very tangible and clear argument. All right, who would like to continue? I think that it comes to a cross-cutting task. We cannot say this one ministry or Senate administration is responsible. All offices and Senate administrations are responsible. We that who are in charge of integration, but also you. So all Senate administrations, and this is the commitment, all agencies have to support the mission statement. 
well, traditionally speaking, both with urban and cooperative, but also with the big private housing associations, it says in their statute, we provide to broad areas and groups of the population. Berlin is growing. We become more multicultural. So one argument would be, why don't we start with the association? So if we are multicultural and if we are becoming more multicultural, then we need a broader focus on diversity in the area of housing. So a mission statement might be a good idea. Thank you. As a federal agency, we are probably not going to sign the Berlin mission statement, but we participate through our advisory council in developing the such mission statement. We are following the process with great interest also to generate best practice and to then support the entire federal approach and system. We Oh, why do we need this? Why should we participate in this? Because we have to talk about discrimination. And an anti-discrimination culture is not something that we can take for granted. So discrimination is there. It exists. We have to ask ourselves, how can we tackle it? Where are the good solutions? And this is just a good process. It's just a good starting point to foster discrimination on dis communication on discrimination, sorry. Ms. Liebsche. Well, my argument would be indivisible. I think we live in a historical moment, not just this, in this country or in this city, but also elsewhere. So equality and human dignity are jeopardized everywhere. So every component and every commitment of different actors based on indivisible and all humans are equal are absolutely necessary. And the city of Berlin is active at different levels. I come from Saxony originally, and I have very close contacts to Saxony. And let me tell you, they look at Berlin. So it's very important what Berlin is doing. It's very important that Berlin develops mission statements like this. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you for laying the foundation, sort of, regarding the mission statement. I am looking forward to getting support from all of you. And thank you for accompanying us in this process. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.